Welcome to chapter 7. This is one of the most important chapters in the book. So, without further ado, and really without overselling the importance of this, you're now at the critical point of using the information you have gathered. Now, as a marketer, if you're doing this for real, you would be looking at the results of your market research, your understanding of consumer behavior or business to business behavior, and now making decisions. So segmentation is the decision making process. It is the point where as a marketer, you are now thinking in terms of how do we create, communicate, deliver and exchange an offering that has value to a customer or client. You are thinking about who is that customer, who is that client. You start defining and profiling this group of people because your objective here is to be able to identify a group in the marketplace, a segment of the broader market who will be most responsive or the most responsive in order, so assuming you're going to be doing this for multiple markets, who will react in a similar way to your product offering, but in a way that's different to the other people. So you're looking for a segmentation strategy that gives you a defined audience, which reacts well to what you're offering in a consistent way that you can then go and target and tailor your messages, your product, your distribution, and your price to meet their needs. Segmentation is also, from my experience, one of the hardest areas for people to come to terms with at a philosophical level and at a practical level. On a philosophical level, you are going to ignore most of the market. Your segmentation is going to be to a very small portion. We're talking percentages in the single figures. A nice 3 to 4% market, it should be a responsive, which means that you've got 96 to 97% that you're not dealing with right now. And for a lot of marketing students, this idea that you're just, this opportunity cost of not talking to everyone at once seems overwhelming. But if you talk to everyone at once, you're effectively addressing nobody. And this is why fragmentation has created this environment in which target markets and target marketing is a much more powerful tool. It's pretty good value before, now it's even stronger. So what you want to be doing here is that we're going to do the STP process, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. We're going to start with segmentation because we want to be able to look at a market, divide it into smaller units, and describe those smaller units. And you wanted to be able to describe multiple units. So this is the first thing. You take the notion of 100%, the whole of the market, then you break it up into smaller fragments. You then, as through your targeting, rank order those targets and work out which order you want to address them and who's first, who's second, down to who you're not going to address at all. Then, and only then, do you go and say, how do we get this market? And we use positioning as the framing to set up for the product, to set up the communication, the distribution, and the price so that we are going to offer something the market wants to the market that's most responsive. So let's take this from the top. This is segmentation. Again, this is one where there's a philosophical component as well as a practical component. Now, segmentation is about the division of the market into smaller segments of like-minded people who have a shared meaningful characteristic that defines them together. It also means that you are going to cluster. So you're going to be doing grouping. There's some market research statistics that in practice you would be using. Uh, when you're doing segmentation, you are looking for things like cluster analysis. But what you're also doing is that when you set these segments, you are saying someone gets first priority, someone gets last priority, or doesn't get a go at all. So you actually need to use an act of discrimination. And this is quite often an ideological breaking point for people. 
If you want to treat everyone equally, you can't do segmentation. If you want to make an offer to everyone, if you see the equality as being the input variable. If you want everyone to have equal access to your opportunity, so you've got a product, it's a great product, but you want everyone to have a chance at it, then you're going to need to use segmentation so you can make certain that everyone is seeing that value in its best light for them. So segmentation can be used to actually achieve better outcomes by using distinct, discrete approaches to different audiences than one blanket measure across the whole. So let's talk in terms of some of the offers that are on the table from existing theory, behavior, and ideas as to how we can make an audience work. Now, top of the list, we've got geography, physicality, geodemographics, and geographics. These are actually incredibly strong variables because these variables change a series of facets about your job, your offer, and even your strategy. So to take you back to chapter three, where we were talking uh, about going global, that's picking a market in an international marketplace, picking a market in a foreign country, is activating geographic segmentation. You are saying local or international. That's the broadest base you can get for geography. When you go to region, you can go down to suburb, you can go down to climate, you can go down to a whole set of postcode based variables. Because you can start looking at the geography aspects in terms of what does a geographic segment do for my distribution strategy. Now geography is a really, uh, as we say, company side view of the world. You are looking at going where on the map suits me. We'll take this township, we'll circle this township and say, right, now let's find out more about the township because we picked it because it's close to where we grow our produce. Let's see whether we can actually get a foothold in that marketplace. In terms of demography, there are a series of elements here. If you're starting to get a sense for age, gender, family structure, these are variables that we had raised in consumer behavior. And as mentioned in consumer behavior, the segmentation elements, you can use a lot of CB theory to underpin and support your segmentation approach. Again, as with CB, age is one of these facets. It's a broad brush. For example, we have the Gen Y, Gen X, Gen Z, baby boomers. The idea that everyone born in a near 20 year window is going to be roughly the same is a convenience made up by people who sell you pop books about generations. This, it's a broad brush and it's not the most effective brush. However, what you can back this up with is psychographics. Now, psychographics is where you really are going to go and get your market research skills on because you're going to have to measure and observe. You're going to have to look into scales, measures of personality traits, measures of various key factors. For example, we've mentioned innovativeness several times. Innovativeness can be measured on a scale where you've got six questions. Uh, it's a Likert scale, so it's from strongly disagree to strongly agree. You get a score then, six questions on a five point scale gives you a score between six and 30. If you score 30, you've got a fast twitch reaction that says, I like things that are new and shiny. And the odds of getting you to buy a subscription to the same product twice is almost nil. But that's something you only really find out by actual engagements and by measurements. Now the trick with psychographics is that we're actually getting consumers to volunteer a lot of this information courtesy of Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and a lot of social media platforms. Facebook was particularly good for this because we could get you to fill out a survey. And so long as we gave you your result and a way you could share it onto your timeline, you felt value. But you also were self-identifying your interests. You were saying, this is what I'm interested in, this is where I'm located. The self-segmentation that Facebook was previously very powerful at 
which they've kind of messed up a little in the last couple of years, and they'll probably get back again at some point. When they decided to make everyone's interests automatically subscribe you to a page that was generated to like those interests, uh, that was kind of messy and ruined it for everybody. But they'll get it back. Now, this is one of the best segmentation techniques to couple with another approach. Here, what you're looking at is behavior, actual activity. Now, the first behavioral segment is user or non-user, which links you straight back to marketing strategy and the Ansoft matrix. If you are segmenting by, these are people who currently use my product, you are starting to say the words existing market. So then your choice is, well, do I want to sell to the people who are currently buying? Do I want to convert a light user to a moderate user, a moderate user to a heavy user, or sell more to the heavy users? And that is how you turn existing market, existing product, through segmentation. That is your strategy is existing market, existing product. Your segmentation is the type of user you think is most likely to buy more of your product. And this is your first segmentation square filled out just simply by drawing on your strategy. Your second element here is when you're looking at users and usage situations. So existing user, new use situation or new occasion to use the product effectively creates a new product. Existing user, new product. Segmentation leads you back to strategy. Strategy leads you to segmentation. So this is where you've got to be consistent. So if you pull up your strategy matrix and say, look, here's the plan. We're going to make a new product and we're going to sell it to our existing users. Then when you come down to behavioral segmentation, you've automatically lit up the user. You're then choosing between which type of user and you're then choosing the usage. So you can actually be driven by your strategy in terms of your segmentation. In terms of business-to-business -business segmentation, this is one of the elements that you are looking at here. Size of the firm, there are certain demographies around the business-to-business uh, -business market, but you're also looking at it from the point of view of, are they a user or a non-user? If they adopt your product, do you need any other audience? And where are they? Now, if you got the rights to supply McDonald's, globally with a product, well, what does that mean for your firm in terms of where you need to be located, where your channels, your supply chains, and everything else about your operation goes? Because if you're dealing with a global organization who wants consistency, can you actually address that? All right, so from segmentation, segmentation brings us to targeting. Again, ideological time. Targeting is where, in segmentation, you describe your audience. You break them up into parts. In targeting, you basically sort that description into order of which is the most attractive to which is the least attractive, which will engage with your offer, and then you pick one. And I mean one. You pick a single market. That's the market you're going to target. Now what you're going to do with your targeting is that your targeting is then going to drive your marketing plan, your marketing planning process. You can do multiple target markets so long as each time you have a, a single individual target market, it has its own marketing plan and its own targeted marketing mix. If you don't have this game plan, it's a lot harder. So how do we do the targeting side? Well, first thing is we need to evaluate the market segments. And when you start looking at this evaluation, it's also very closely linked back to the idea of the objectives. You want your evaluations really to have that sort of specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and some of the level timetabled. So you want to look at a market segment and say, do the people who are in this market have enough similarity? Do they respond 
in a like manner to an offer. Because here's the key, if you're gonna put, say, you wanna set up a new restaurant and you want it to be the best steak restaurant in the south of Canberra, then you're not really gonna want a vacant in your target audience. If on the other hand, you're offering the best vegetarian restaurant in the south, you could have vegetarians and vacants. They will both respond similarly. If you're having a steak restaurant, vegetarian and vacants are no use to you, so you don't want them as an audience. So are the members of the audience sufficiently similar that they will react well to the same offer? And also, are they sufficiently different from other segments? So this is one of the elements that you can com collapse and combine markets if they have sufficient similarity and they'll work together. When we get to services, we'll occasionally mention the idea of that you can have conflicting customers. So if you set out to be the to create the youth band pop sensation of the summer, and your target audience is 15 to 17 year olds, females with discretionary incomes who buy merchandise at 10 concerts and have uh, one or more Tumblr accounts, and your first concert consists largely of an audience of middle-aged motorcycle fans, you've got an audience clash. Start with, I'm not entirely certain how um, you, what your pop music was that got the Hells Angels interested. Congrats on that front. But you've got an audience clash, and the audiences aren't going to coexist nicely. One audience will feel threatened by another. Most likely, the bikies are going to feel a bit put off by the uh, teens. So... Your segments are gonna, if the segments are radically different, you need two different marketing strategies. You need two different approaches. And we can do that in a lot of ways, and we've been able to do that uh, in terms of audiences, you know, the segmentation of an audience or the change through distribution channels or making a variance to the product offer. But your segmentation is gonna be key here. Your second part is, can you measure the segment? You can create it, so you can work it out on a piece of paper, but can you actually assess it? And that leads to the next part of, can you get to it? Can your marketing communications actually reach your market segment? Okay, if you've got a segment in mind, so I'll go back again. I want my uh, 35 to 40 year old male motorcycle owner. I want to target them. What's my marketing comms channel that reaches them? So we need to know that how to get to this person, how to reach them. So this is where your segmentation will drive your marketing mix and will also assist your promotion mix. Now one of the things when you're doing a market segment evaluation is you want to keep your notes. Because when you do things like, how, you know, what does this segment do? What's, how do we describe this segment? Then we come down to the marketing mix and we go and say, well, how do we reach this segment? Let's go look at what they do, what are they into, what are they interested in. For example, we've got Future Music Festival traveling the country at the moment, and Laneway Festival traveling the country, that these two music festivals have very distinct audiences. Now, Laneway is very much your Triple J crowd, and Future Music is very much your Triple M your um, FM station. So with a dance music festival, who else would be interested in that festival, in that festival's audience? What other communications could be sold on during that element? So as well as understanding your market segment for who they are, what they're interested in, you also want to be understanding them in terms of what else can we on sell? What else can we do for this audience? Your final two questions are, is the segment big enough to be worth the money? Can it be profitable? Frequently, you'll find great segments that are of no use because you just can't make enough money from them. This again has a series of strategy implications to it. Occasionally, you'll find a segment that looks great, no profit, but they're opinion leaders. And if you can just write out the losses of getting the opinion leaders on board, the second, third, and fourth tier markets that don't emerge until the opinion leaders are on board suddenly become profitable. And lastly, the big question is, if you've got this segment and you know them and you understand them, 
can you meet their needs? And that's where your product comes in. So segment profiles, this is an area of the text I want you to have a look at. And I really, it's an important one because it's so valuable for making your life easier as a marketer. Top of your profiling is if you can understand what benefits, what is the state difference? Because we know that there is a needs and wants and the customer is saying they go, I am dissatisfied with where I currently am. I wish to be somewhere else. I am hungry, therefore I want food. What are the benefits though I'm seeking? Is it speed and convenience? Is it flavor? Is it social connection? What is it that I'm looking for as my benefits? If I can build a segment profile around people of similar demand for benefit, then a core common product becomes valuable to that audience. What are the media habits? Where do we find this person? What do they watch? What do they listen to? What do they read? How do we embed? How do we work with that media? So you've got TV shows with specific audiences. You're keen on reaching the audience that watches Agent Carter, the Marvel spin-off. Now, Agent Carter has got a historical setting of the 50s, so it's going to be difficult to put a product placement in there. But you can advertise during that show because you know the, ge the demographics and the psychographics of the audience. You can look at the audience that watches the Tonight shows, the comedy shows. You can go and set up an audience that they use Twitter a lot. They have a Twitter account. Communicate with them. What you're doing here is that you're basically building a profile to understand where can we reach this person? Where can we reach a person, a typical person of this audience? And the last two parts, the demographics, the broad base, age, gender, how do we identify them? How do we spot them in a lineup? And the buying behavior. Where are they in that list? Are they the heavy buyers that we're selling more to or we're reinforcing their loyalty? Are they the medium buyers who we can try and get to buy more frequently? Are they the light buyers who we try to move to the medium category? What is their current behavior and what are we trying to facilitate? Final question in terms of what are we going to do with our targeting strategy is we're going, there are three types of targeting strategy. The book talks about four. And I'm here to tell you that undifferentiated marketing is a terrible life choice. So we're not going to want you to do that. So in terms of the different market approaches, differentiated marketing is, to my mind, one of the strengths of marketing and one of the reasons to do marketing in the first place. Undifferentiated marketing is the sales orientation and the production orientation. It's not even really marketing. It's throw everything you got at the wall and see what sticks. And if you throw things hard enough, the wall doesn't even stick. It's a poor, poor use of resources. It's used and sometimes it's mistakenly believed to be in use. So you see Coca-Cola and there's Coke signs everywhere, but Coke has strategies and multiple markets. You can deploy multiple marketing strategies at once and it will look as if you're doing undifferentiated, when in fact you are doing a very caref carefully constructed differentiated market. Differentiated means that you take different approaches to each of your targeted segments, and this is, to my mind, the best approach. It lets you make the most out of your understanding of that audience, and quite often you can take the same basic core product and really push it so that it goes into a series of different markets where you haven't changed the actual product, you haven't changed the augmented product, you've changed the core product, and it's giving different benefit and different outcomes to a series of markets. And that's brilliant, that's what you want, because you're satisfying a whole lot of people, and a whole lot of people are having a better day, because you understood their needs, and you've explained to them how your product solves their problem. Also on this figure, I'd just like to point out the concentrated marketing, the single segment only. This is quite frequently what we would describe as the differentiation strategy because you've gone to a new market with a new product. You've got to put your resources into getting that, the foothold in that market. 
So concentrated marketing strategy is often used for new products, targeting innovators, building a single cohesive approach so that you can then build on the capture of that initial market to reach segments who are close in nature but still sufficiently different to warrant a, a second generation or third generation marketing strategy. Now, one of the things I just want to draw your attention to here in terms of undifferentiated, there is an error in the text and on the screen here, Woolworths uses differentiated marketing. It may appear to use undifferentiated marketing, but to test that theory, go to Woolworths over a period of days. Pick a Woolworths and go at different times of the day. So 12 p.m., 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m. Then go at 7 p.m., 8 p.m., and 9 p.m. Listen to the music that's played. Make a note of the music that's played over the PA. Then go back and look at the age of the songs. And you'll start to see that depending on the time of day, they've worked out roughly the age of the shopping cohort. So which music is comforting and reassuring as music from their youth? Depending on your time of day, you can get the 70s, 80s, 90s, or contemporary based on who they think the dominant audience is going to be in the store. And this is differentiated marketing. It's changing the environment so it's comfortable. And with their loyalty cards and with their credit, with the shopping information that they're collecting through observation and market research, they know right now that people who grew up in the 80s are going to be at certain life stages. So they know roughly when they're going to be able to be in the store. So the soundtrack that's going to be played around 3.30 to 4.30 of the stopping at the shops on the way home with the kids because you have to pick up something for the after school is going to be a different audio soundtrack to the it's 2.30 in the afternoon, you're not at work, the retiree crowd on the uh, 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning so there's going to be the different audio to give that different environment to create the different feel to Woolworths. And that is why it's so vital to understand your segmentation. It's also where age gets to be useful. Now in terms of differentiated strategies, the different needs, different products for each segment. We see this a lot. Um, Apple less is appearing less and less so to do this until you realize that the one device, the iPhone, is pitched as a phone, as a camera, as a portable computer, as a platform for applications, as a platform for music, and then you suddenly realize that actually they're selling different products. They're selling different core products. The actual products are the same. There is a small sarcastic note here in an Australian text describing Starbucks as a smaller company. The Starbucks franchise in Australia is a smaller company because it came out here with an undifferentiated strategy. It didn't realize that it needed to go with a concentrated or differentiated strategy for each of its regional outposts. And it got somewhat financially hammered for its uh, error. The last element to this in the strategies is the customization. And this is really quite common in the services marketing. So we'll talk about it again in the services marketing framework. But suffice to say, the idea here with a customized target is that you can have a product that can be variable. High customization means high variability, which means you're dealing with a series of services marketing issues, but you're also dealing with the capacity to charge more and have a higher premium because you are dealing with an audience that's willing to pay more for services that best suit them. All right, the third step of this is the positioning strategy. And this is the opening gambit to a set of information, a set of ideas that will flow through again in product and in promotion. It also picks up a little bit in price. Now, positioning means that you're building a strategy around 
addressing an audience and fitting your product into their perception. And this is where some of the real magic of marketing happens. Perception governs reality. And a positioning strategy, you look at where does your where is your competition in the market? Now you'll note that ANU's brand is thought leader. The leadership brand, the thinking, the positioning, so that we're looking at when you're thinking about universities and you think about the ANU, who are the competitors either side of you? When you start thinking about a product in terms of what's a similar product, what's a like product to it? What's comparable? You think about a Pepsi Max, what's comparable? Is it a Diet Coke or Diet Sprite or Red Bull? Is it Max, is the Red Bull an energy drink? Is Diet Red Bull an energy drink? Therefore, it's a uh, competitor's its position in the marketplace is alongside Mother and V. Or is it a diet drink that sits alongside Diet Coke and sugar-free Pepsi Max? Where do these elements sit? Once you've worked out where the competitors sit in the marketplace, what are you better at than they are? What's your edge over them? So what's your competitive advantage? What do you do better than they do? And how do you communicate that to the audience? Because one of the things in positioning is that you're building off an old theory, Rogers 1995 idea around innovation adoption was that you had five key characteristics that really mattered. And one of those key characteristics was relative advantage. The other one was compatibility. So what did you do better? Why were you the better choice without being so far different that you didn't fit into the lifestyle of someone who was already using a similar product? And now we're going to bring up one last theory to raise here. There's a series of the texts that's going to talk about positioning strategies, perceptual maps. It's really good material to look at. It also occurs in advertising, and we have a full-length course on advertising. Brand personality is an element that I just want to draw your attention to here as part of positioning and segmentation, because it will come back up in product and it will come back up in advertising. So this idea of the brand personality is to create a persona and a character for the brand so that the brand can be easily communicated as to who is likely to like it and who is likely to dislike it. So you're looking at here for your segments, your brand personality lets you try and build a, a character persona for your product so that it would connect with or completely disengage a market segment. Because a critical factor here is that in segmentation you have audiences you don't want. And you need to, to fend those audiences off your product as much as you need to recruit the audiences you do want. And with that little contradiction of thinking, this is the chapter for se the segmentation. It is quite seriously and quite literally one of the most significant and important parts of marketing thinking. The marketing concept, the market orientation, the consumer-led design, all these facets that we're going to talk, we've talked about, what's going to happen in the second shift when we start now talking about the marketing mix, all come down to the same point. You have an audience in mind who's clearly defined, who will react in a like-minded manner to your offer, and that manner is different. It's a different reaction to audiences to the left and to the right of them, and that you clearly know who this audience is. You know where to find them. You know what their interests are. You know what their needs and wants are. You know a description of them. You know a profile of them, so you know how to engage them. And you need these audiences, you need the segments to be specific. They need to be measurable. You need to be able to get to them. It needs to be realistic that they are a segment that you can actually address 
and you need to ensure that you know the segments you want and the segments you don't want. And it's the segments you don't want that come down into product and make it really interesting. Because there are people who are the wrong fit for your product, so you don't you want to discourage them from using your product. And with that, that's the chapter. As usual, contact me on any of the platforms on the screen. Hit me up on my Twitter, at Stephen Dan, or connect across on the email if you need me, stephen.dan at anu.edu.au. Segmentation is segmentation targeting and positioning. I can't stress enough. It's critical. It's the thing that makes the difference between the success and failure of businesses. Because if you know who the audience is and you can get to them and you can engage them and you understand them, it gets so much easier to make a marketing offer to them. And we're going to spend the next chapters are going to be about making that offer.